morning, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world, and welcome back to another episode of From the Field to the Track. As always, I am joined by my lovely co-host and best friend, Katie. Katie, how are you today? I'm actually pretty tired today, but that is okay. Um, yeah, my brain is pretty much gone, so I apologize for all the mistakes and things I'm probably going to say, but we are five days into three weeks of exams, so we push forward. We move, we move. And you know what? Katie's doing a great job as per usual, managing it all and balancing it all. Um, so yeah, if you're watching this, you better give Katie some good luck vibes. Not that she needs it, but you better, you better keep her in your mind. Um, yeah, it's, we obviously are into us. This is our second race week into our three little little English um second race week into our triple header race week um obviously we have five races left of the season which is quite a crazy thing to think about because this season has just gone by so fast um but let's start off with our small kind of debrief on what Coda was because it's kind of been some time since the Texas Grand Prix um obviously Charles Leclerc won his third Grand Prix winning both in winning pretty much all the milestone Grand Prix for him winning his home Grand Prix winning the one in Monza, obviously, Ferrari's home Grand Prix. They're winning his birthday Grand Prix as well. He's really just done it all. And then it's just really sad because, like, he has these amazing weekends and then he'll just have a weekend and you're like, like, how have you gone from having all of the luck in the world to having no luck at all? It's just like, that's the epitome of Charles Leclerc. Obviously, his third third race win of the season, as I said, um, Ferrari are great, gaining ever closer and increasingly closer to Red Bull in the Constructors' Championship, opening up that battle for second place and inevitably first place. I don't think McLaren have really checked out there. But um, yeah, I think Red Bull are in, Red Bull are in danger of losing two spots in the Constructors' Championship in the span of one year, which is quite unheard of for Red Bull. But Katie, your thoughts on the Coda Grand Prix? Coda Grand Prix is always a good time. I just love that track. Like, watching the cars go around that track, it is probably, like, my favourite like, race track that they race at um, in terms of, like, that the big stars around that corner and the big flag and, oh, it's just so cool. And I mean, lots of racetracks have those, but they have one of those things that, like, right beside the um, pit entry. Yeah, pit entry with, with like, where everyone is. I just love those. I just think they're so cool. Um, Yeah, and, of course, served uh, Sprint and Grand Prix, of course. So that was always – that was good. Yeah. I like I loved it. I think that the Texas Grand Prix was quite exciting for us all. It was a very exciting race, actually. Um – while Charles Leclerc did kind of check out in front and had times where he was like 11 seconds out and everything doing his best Max Verstappen impression, I feel like even though we have like these massive, massive like chunks for the lead and sometimes and sometimes whoever, even we saw it in Singapore, um, where the driver who was leading, Lando Norris, um, yes, they were like checked out of the race, but like everyone behind them was still like um, fighting for points and fighting for places and everything like that. And it made a very good, uh, very good, in- very interesting thing to watch, a very interesting spectacle as well. Let's talk about our, our favorite two rookies of the season, the only two rookies of the season, Liam Lawson and Franco Colapinto. Franco Colapinto, uh, we'll start off with him before we go to Liam Lawson. Franco Colapinto has now out-qualified Alex Albon more times than Logan Sargent has in his time, in, in his five races in Formula 1. Um unfortunately yeah it, like they, someone did a really unfair com- I think it's an unfair comparison to I actually don't know what's an unfair comparison to make because I actually arguably think that the Williams car of last year was way better than the Williams car of this year and that's reflected in the championship standings because Williams this year are significantly lower than when they were last year but yeah in Frank Colpinto's like first five races in Formula One he's scored like an outrageous amount of points in comparison to Logan Sargent who had zero points um but yeah Katie, your thoughts on Franco Colapinto's performance during Coda and your thoughts on whether he deserves a seat for next season. Obviously, he is in contention for the Sauber seat, but there are rumours that he may not get the seat um, due to them prioritising experience and wanting someone like Valtteri Bottas in the car over him. I mean, Franco, if Franco doesn't get the seat, he can't say he didn't give it a bloody good shot because he has. Um, Again, he just gets that car every weekend and everyone thinks, no, this will be a weekend that he's off. He's done incredibly well. He has well out, out exceeded sorry, all expectations that people had placed on him. Um, and he is winning over the hearts of fans as well, which is important. You've got a team like Stake who needs um, Salba, I guess, whatever you want to call it. Um, they, they need money. 
and you bring in a driver like, I don't know, Valtteri Bottas obviously brings in a lot of sponsors as well. Franco Colapinto has won over the hearts of a lot of people. He's also got a pretty passionate nation behind him as well. Um, so both bring pretty good both market value and drivability. Um, the only thing that Valtteri has that Franco possibly doesn't is experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm. I'm really excited to see where where they go because there's also been talks about um potentially Valtteri Bottas returning to Mercedes in a reserve driver role, which I think would be really interesting. And he said that if he he would love to return home, which I think is quite wholesome and quite adorable. And I I I, I, cry, I almost cried when I saw that. But yeah, I think it's really been interesting to see what Frank Colapinto's development has been like in Formula One. Obviously, Katie and I have spoken about this before, and we just say that he's very much brought his Formula Two mentality into Formula One, not Formula Two mentality mentality has done him no ends of good because he's just had that mentality of look I'm racing for my future even though I am an F1 even though I am surrounded by all these amazing people like they mean nothing unless I have a seat for next year or unless I have my future like held down I think that's ultimately been such a good reason as to why he has been performing so well on the other hand we have um, Liam Lawson in his fifth race oh six sorry sixth race of Formula One um during Texas he did score points as well and outperformed Yuki Tsunoda it was a good weekend for the rookies outperforming their teammates on both accords um your thoughts also but first before we get into all of that your thoughts on Liam Lawson versus Fernando Alonso listen what Liam Lawson did is he said I'm replacing a big personality so I'm just going to come in and I'm going to be a big personality as well I'm going to come in I'm going to basically non-stop talk about Lightning Queen I'm then going to have a fight with a driver who is about to have his 400th race this might be my sixth hold on I'm not going to go for the guy who's on how many has Franco done like four or five. Four. Four. I'm not. I'm not going to go for that guy. I'm not going to go for let's say maybe a humble Alex Albon only on a hundred. No, I'm going to go for the guy with four hundred, almost a hundred times the races that I've done. I'm. I'm. You no, know what? I'm going to go for him, and I'm not only going to try challenge him once in the sprint. I'm then going to go and do it again in the Grand Prix. Yeah, and that, my friend, is the Kiwi spirit. Like, we we don't always have the best car. We don't always have the, like, most money. But we always have the best attitude. Yeah, yeah. Um, We always think that we can do it, that Kiwi ingenuity. The 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 number eight wire mentality. (laughs) Yeah, I think it was really crazy. I just remember, like... I don't even remember them fighting during the sprint race. There was not a lot I remember from the sprint race, to be fair. Um, I just remember them, like, just seeing a photo that someone had posted of, like, Liam Lawson and Fernando Alonso, and Fernando Alonso was audibly, like, getting mad at, or, like, you can see throughout the photo that he's obviously really mad at Liam Lawson, and then it's, like, come out, and Liam Lawson has said that he'll, like, take him take his head off or something. What did he say that he, like... What did he, he said something outrageous, and I'm just like, that is crazy. That is most Fernando. Fernando Alonso also said that Alpha Tauri can't drive, which one is funny. Two, it's not even called Alpha Tauri. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to know that he also no, doesn't know what the name of the team is because I just think that he's a, a, with the other members of the F1 community who can't remember what the Cubs name is sometimes. But I just think that um, that proves once again. I think once again, if we have, we will die on the hill that we need more rookies in Formula One because it, yes. I feel like we are seeing with these new wave of rookies and rather the the next wave of them that they don't really have the fear. They don't really have... Yes, they respect these drivers and they've been looking up to them their entire careers. Obviously, Fernando Alonso has been racing longer than Franco... Oscar and Liam have been alive. Like that's how that's how long his Formula One stint has lasted, right? But they they look up to him and they're like, "Yes, you're my idol." But also, it's like you're my idol, but you're also someone that I need to challenge on the track. And it's having that respect, but also knowing that I need to be you for my future and for like because it's a sport. And I feel like they have that, and it's very interesting to see how it's all kind of working and everything like that. And I'm so thrilled to see next season when we potentially see so many more rookies on the grid full time and how that kind of balances itself out. And it's just, I, I think um, Liam Lawson did an amazing and phenomenal job this weekend. Obviously, it did hurt not seeing Danny Rick come in on his horsey McCorse into the Austin paddock. But like Liam Lawson has done everything that Alpha Tauri really, oh, sorry, V Carb wanted out of him and everything I can imagine Lauren Mackey's wanted out of him. And so did Helma Marco and um, Helma Marco as well. Katie, your thoughts on his stint in Austin? Did really well. Obviously came from the 
back 19th got all the way back up to p9 which was gorgeous um yeah and did just really well i'm really proud of him um i just can't wait to see what he does for the rest of the year mm-hmm. and hopefully he gets a chance next year as well mm-hmm. Very exciting times ahead for um, V Club and Liam Lawson as well. Um, let's move on to our news stories of the week. So we didn't really do an in-depth coda preview de- debrief because I felt like it was going to come out during this part right here. So I was like, why double up on it when we might as well just say it here? So McLaren have uh, put in a formal complaint to the FIA um, regarding Lennon Norris's five-second time penalty at the end of the coda Grand Prix. If you are unaware by now, Obviously, Lennon Norris gets a five-second time penalty for leaving the track and gaining a lasting advantage, a penalty that was given to um, George Russell at the beginning of the race, as well as Pierre Gasly and Yuki Tsunoda throughout the race as well. Oscar Piastri did get the penalty as well during the sprint race. The FIA were cracking down on the penalty. Now, here is my thoughts and opinions on this. Um, I think the penalty makes sense. The, the, what Lando has done, he has gone off the track and he has gained a lasting advantage. I personally don't understand why McLaren did not tell Lando Norris to give back the penalty because yeah. you have seen several times your own driver in Oscar Piastri got penalized for it yesterday. You were faster than Max Verstappen. It was very evident. It was very clear that you were faster than Max Verstappen with three races left. With oh, Sorry, with three laps left. You let him pass, you overtake him again. I know it would you would have lost a little bit of time, but there were still three laps. And if even if you didn't overtake him, you still end up with the same result that we have now, Lando Norris P4, Max Verstappen P3. However, what is what is interesting about this entire situation and why I do understand McLaren and a lot of people in F1's frustration and a lot of people's confusion is um, why Max Verstappen did not get the same penalty during lap one. So... The FIA kind of give lenience because it's lap one and they know that lap one incidents happen. But how can, but I just don't like, I think a very fair point has been made that it still is a thing that happens and it's still happening. So why does Max Verstappen not get a penalty and why does um, the rest of the drivers do get a penalty? Because that was a big talking point, even not only for um, McLaren, but also drivers like um, George Russell, who got the penalty as well, who was like, why didn't Max get a penalty as well? Um, the hearing will be tomorrow. I really don't think that anything will come out of it. Um, but yeah, Katie, your thoughts and opinions on McLaren to contest the five-second penalty that Landon Norris was given. I think you're right there. Consistency needs to be had. Um, FAA does this all the time. They like to just kind of pick and choose who they give penalties to. Usually, the odds are against Red Bull, but... Um, They've come out on top this weekend. <laughs> They've come out on top. And it was really weird because How it was much such a... pass some money to the Montenegro <laughs> table props. <laughs> to um, I don't know why but we're... it was really, it was really weird as well. Weird. Yeah. Because, no. like, Red Bull had their whole, like, um, disobeying Park for May rules as well and that entire thing, which I think is really funny because they, they're the... <laughs> I think it's really funny because it's like Red Bull were the ones that were so strongly against McLaren's rear wing, which wasn't even illegal, but they are the ones that have now actually, like, been illegal and, like, disobeyed Park for May rules and, like, regulations and, like, changed their car after first, like, in Park for May, which is highly illegal and literally says in the rules, you're not allowed to touch your car. And, and like, that was fine. And, like, everyone was like, oh, okay. And everyone was like, oh, like, you guys were so cut about McLaren not having their rear. And, like, fair enough, I get why you were mad. But also, like, don't turn around and go and cheat again. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the double standards like, whack and crazy. But, yeah, I just, I think my friend Emma, she, like, we were talking about this and we were like, McLaren make, McLaren need to stop acting like a midfield team when they are leading the Constructors' Championship, when they yeah. have a driver in contention to win the championship. Yes, I ha- uh, yes, I know that this is the first era of dominance you've had pretty much since your Lewis Hamiltons and your Jensen Buttons were at the team. But you are now leading the Constructors' Championship. You now have a chance to win the Drivers' Championship. And honestly, if you keep on going the way you are, you are going to lose this based on just not even mistakes that the drivers have made, based on mistakes that the team has made because you are acting like you are a midfield team. And yes, you can get away with these mistakes in the midfield and you can get away with them because, you know, not not a lot is on stake. Realistically, when you're going from fighting for like P4 in the Constructors' Championship to P1 in the Constructors' Championship, that's a very big jump. Um, mm. And I know that it's still new and still fresh, but they make so many. Like, even if you go back to Hungary, like, I think Hungary will always be the one moment when we look back on the 2024 season and everything that happened, we'll just always have to go back to Hungary and be like, Whatever McLaren did there, we need to avoid 
doing that again because that yeah. was absolutely crazy. And they've made several mistakes throughout lots of times throughout the season. And I just I just think, yeah, once again, just for a team that is leading the constructors, they don't need to be making midfield mistakes. Katie, what were you? I, I think like what they really need, they need George Russell in there. They need George Russell to give them a little presentation that ends in the premise that consistency is key. FIA can also be in this room. They mm-hmm. We just need some consistency. That is how they are going to win this. Rather than just kind of latching on to these small opportunities and taking these chances, they actually just need to just do some good drives here and there, try get some points on Max. I mean, at this point, I think Max has run, ran away with it, to be fair. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but they need to use the rest of this year to – not try things out, not take chances, just to show that they're consistent, finish in first in constructors, finish in second in drivers, and just call it a that. Like, just do well, you know? I know what you mean. And it's like, it's something outrageous. Like, Lando needs to outscore Max Verstappen by 11.5 points per race. And, like, yes, if Lando Norris, like, say we go to, say we go to Mexico, like, I, I think a big thing is that the next few tracks on the calendar really suit the McLaren car. I feel like Coda wasn't a track where they came into the track thinking that it wasn't going to suit their car and fair enough, whatever. However, I think obviously we have tracks like Qatar, we have tracks like Brazil, and especially Mexico as well coming up, and we know that those tracks suit the McLaren and have suited the McLaren since even last year when they, when they started their era of kind of dominance and whatever you want to call it. Um... But say, like, Max Verstappen DNFs one race, or, like, say Max Verstappen DNFs one race, and Lando Norris goes on to win that race, he's now 25, he's gained 25 points, Max Verstappen. Yeah. He, realistically, unfortunately for McLaren, they have to have really good races, but they also really have to prey on the downfall of Red Bull, or they have to pray that Red Bull will make a mistake here and there. And obviously... Red Bull don't make the mistakes that McLaren do. And I think we mentioned this before. I think it was a few episodes ago. It's not even about who has the faster car anymore. It's about which team will make the less stupid mistakes. Do you know what I mean? It's just like whichever team has their has their life together, has everything together. Like Katie likes to say, you have to have all the ing- ingredients to make a cake to win a championship. Uh, you need to have them all. And McLaren, they don't have all the ingredients right now. Whereas Red Bull, they do have – they have – they don't have all the ingredients, but they have most of the ingredients. Do you know what I'm saying? And they've baked a few good cakes in the past. McLaren hasn't yeah. baked a good cake in a while. Yeah, McLaren haven't baked a good cake since, like, Lewis Hamilton and Jensen Button were there. Like, man, yeah. maybe call up Jensen Button and, like, get Jensen Button to, like, get in get in McLaren. And maybe that's, like, our, our key, our secret. Um, But another... Jensen Button about- made the headlines in the, week, in the weekend as well. He was rather annoyed with a certain... Oh, brilliant- my God. I love I love the Jensen Honestly. Button and Danica Patrick's like <laughs> it's so funny. Every time I see him, I'm just like I like like I just oh my god. Hi, editing Tiana here. If anyone was wondering what that was, that was my sister. She walked into my room and scared me. So that's just all you need to know there. I it, I all as well, but I just got scared by my sister. I know that Jensen Button is like infuriated every time he gets put on with Danica Patrick and I just know that it's so funny every single time but nevertheless you know something about Jensen Button tell me about Jensen Button got quite a long middle name (laughs) (laughs) okay if you don't know the joke that Katie's no it's not a joke just leave it if they don't know it they don't know it they don't know it they don't know it okay um helmet Marco once again talking about (laughs) red Bull talking Oh, and you know what we should do later? Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in later. We'll do it at the end of today. Okay. Um, but- okay, um, moving on from, obviously, we're talking about Red Bull. We're talking about McLaren. Let's talk about another Red Bull member and a McLaren member. Um, this time, Helmut Marko has been in the news once more. I feel like last week we had so many things that Helmut Marko has said and done, which just confused us massively. And seemingly the 81 year old yes he's 81 i was like how how are you how, how are you still here like retire please retire um anyways he has been spinning a lot spinning lies again seemingly he essentially came out yesterday and spoke to the media and was like yeah piastri piastri's management in intensive talks with the red bull like piastri is going to red bull like guys like don't like like bet your houses on it oscar piastri is coming to red bull and at first i read that and i was like i was like damn like Oscar Piastri how could you do me like that then I remembered his management is Mark Webber 
Do you really honestly think that Mark Webber, after everything that happened between Mark Webber and Red Bull and Sebastian Vettel, do you really honestly think that Mark Webber wants to sit down and have a conversation with Christian Horner and Helmut Marko and the entire Red Bull team about Oscar Piastri's future? I personally think over that man's dead body he would. I, I, I don't think that would work. Anyways, Piastri has come out today and said that he is extremely happy with where he is and that, to his knowledge, no talks are being had with Red Bull. Um, also, Red Bull need to remember that they do have an extensively massive, massive driver academy. And um, they have a driver that's contracted for next season. So can we <laughs> stop, 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 just stop. Um, but Katie, your thoughts on the, the potential of Oscar Piastri going to Red Bull? He doesn't suit Red Bull. He mm. suits McLaren, kind of. If he was going to go somewhere, he'd go Mercedes of the of the three, the big three. Mm. Um, uh, yeah, as you said, the whole Mark Webber thing, he just wouldn't go. But do, do you know? Do you know who's only on? So he's got a three year contract at McLaren, mm-hmm. and he's only on six mil. That's that's crazy. Yeah, I think. I feel like it's got to be like one of those deals where it gets like increasingly higher as they go on because I feel like if McLaren win the constructors championship yes this year they get a whole bunch of money just injected into them so then that like makes room for like Oscar Piastri salary to go up because I know like Landon Norris is some, on is on something outrageous like 20 million or something like that which every single time I think about it I'm just like that's a crazy amount of even six even be, like the fact that we sat here and was like oh six million is not that much six million is still a laughable amount of money to get paid to do a job like even a Logan Sargent being on one million dollars to do a job and you're like not even talking about the money that he's going to get paid in like sponsors or anything like that you're just talking purely what an, what a team is paying you and i just think that's crazy but yeah um i don't think i don't think piastri is going to red bull i also can't see like piastri doesn't suit alpine either like when, you know when you talk about driver suiting a team he did not suit alpine at all like now that i think about it can you imagine like when i think about oscar piastri like sometimes it'll come up with oscar in like a renault suit or like a alpine suit and i'm like that just doesn't look right like it just it looks so wrong but yeah um helmet marco uh, king i i think it's time for you to hang up the boots i think it's time for you to um live on the coast of italy and call it a day um watch f1 in your spare time but really i just think that but also i think that helmet marco keeps f1 interesting because he just says so many things all the time and i'm just like i i know if i want a good story i'm gonna go to helmet marco and like get him to spin some lies because it's reliable coming out of him it's not reliable coming out of me you know what i mean uh, anyways, on to actually what is happening this week in the Mexican Grand Prix. We are racing in Mexico. Um, once again, it is Sergio Perez's home Grand Prix. We love a good home Grand Prix and from the field to the track. So we are extremely excited for Sergio Perez. Like Katie mentioned before, Fernando Alonso's 400th start in F1. He has been racing since 2001. Obviously, he did have a break um, throughout after his stint at McLaren and then came back in 2020. One, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure it's 2021 to Alpine. Um, um, yeah, I also think it's really crazy, like I mentioned before, that he has been racing longer than Oscar Piastri, Franco Colapinto, and Liam Lawson have been al- alive. But Katie, yeah. I want to know your favorite moment that has happened in the entirety of, like, let's just talk about since the start of Fernando Alonso's F1 career to 2024 to now. What is a crazy moment that has happened while Fernando Alonso has still been racing? Like, like for in Fernando? The, in, no, in the entire world. Oh, just, just like a world event. Just to give us a perspective on how crazy and how long the stint has been. Uh, 9th of May, 2005. A superstar was born. <laughs> <laughs> no, oh, yeah. I was born. I was born. He won the championship like four months later. Um, I was born and he won the championship like five months later, six months later. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he's, he's, had a, he's had a few big moments. Um, yeah, we've had like some pretty significant wars. Um, yeah. Just a bunch of wild things happening. I just think it's crazy. When he started, ra- when he started racing, he also, like, the first Apple iPod, like, came out. 
and now we're on the iPhone, what, like 16, 15? I don't know. What no, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure if one TV used to be black and white back then. Yeah, like they, they, you, had, you used to have like cable, the cable TVs, but you had to like, like yeah. tune them in. <laughs> That's how long Fernando Alonso has been raising for. Yeah. But honestly, as much as everyone, as much as we like to make fun of Fernando Alonso here um, and just like have a good laugh here and there, Fernando Alonso has been a, a racing icon, has been such a legend for um, Formula One, obviously. He hasn't won a race in quite some time, but obviously it's all in due time. And I feel like Aston Martin potentially next year get a better car. Well, obviously, when Mr. Adrian Newey comes to the team, hopefully we see a few races being won by Aston, um, by Fernando Alonso. And I will stick by my point of Fernando Alonso will be Formula One's helmet Marco. He will like he will be the driver's version of helmet Marco. He'll just stick around. He'll just stick around until teams just like kick him out until someone just says sorry. Like you, it's actually a hate safety hazard for you to be in the car, mate. Like you, <laughs> you've got to retire now. But Katie, your thoughts on Fernando Alonso's four hundredth Grand Prix start this weekend? I'm very excited for him. Um, it could easily be his fourth. <laughs> he like, looks so young. He's so young. Um, no, it's I mean it's pretty amazing. Like, is that the longest i think he i think he does have the longest but let me just, i'd say so hold on let's do a little bit of research i think it is it definitely sounds like it but i don't want to be but like it's so, like and then it's like him then lewis like it, current drivers are like the ones that have been racing for the longest i'm pretty I'm sure drivers longest well she googles that i'll i'll give you guys a little bit of a look into what's going to be happening this weekend yeah. okay yeah tell me going. Tell me. No, you guys, all right. Okay, so it's like this is the list. After, this was updated after the 2024 Monaco Grand Prix um, for the drivers who have the longest career streak. In 2022, during the Azerbaijan Grand Prix, Fernando Alonso broke the record for the longest Formula One career. Um, he has 23 years and continuing. The next closest person was Michael Schumacher, who had 21 years, three months, and zero days. And then the, the last one for the top three is Kimi Raikkonen, who has 20 yeah. years and nine nine months and eight days. And then let's look for Lewis Hamilton, actually. Cause I thought Lewis, Lewis Hamilton... Hamilton- Lewis Hamilton currently has 17 years. So he's got so he's got a quite a way to go to beat Fernando Alonso. He's obviously got to outscore Fernando by a few years as well. And I honestly don't see that happening. No. But yeah. Fernando Alonso Ex- hasn't had anything else happening in his life. But you know Fernando what I mean? Alonso's- like Lu- Lewis Hamilton's got other shit on. But Fernando's like, ugh. I've got to come into work again today. Like, oh. Yeah. He's just been nine to fiving since 2001. (laughs) This has been one of those people who, like, is going to finish his career. And, you know, they'll be like, oh, this person's leaving and they've spent 23 years at the company. Like, they've been on the same workstation. That's Fernando Alonso. (laughs) Think about, like, one of the older people at your workplace and it's just like, oh, like, they know everything. And, like, whenever you have a problem or anything, you have to go to them because they, like, know the ins and outs of the place. And, like, if they retire, that's, like, what what will happen with Fernando Alonso. So, um, if he ever retires, I, like, don't know. I feel like Formula One should just call a worldwide public holiday when Fernando Alonso retires because I just think we need one because that will be a crazy time. But, Katie, your um, like we mentioned before, McLaren versus Red Bull versus Ferrari, the championship battle for not only the driver's championship but the constructor's championship as well is well and truly heating up and well and truly getting, um, getting there. Obviously, both... Um, I'm pretty sure everyone up to Lewis Hamilton in the driver standings can still win the championship. So that is um, Lando, Max, Charles, Oscar, and Carlos. I'm pretty sure that's our. Those are the people who can win the championship. My money's on Carlos. My money too is. Oh no, actually, my money's on um, um, Oscar Piastri coming out of the woodworks. Like I just yeah. think that everyone's focusing on the wrong people here. Like Carlos signs to farewell. Um, to, fa- to farewell Ferrari in the nicest way possible and give him give them their like drivers championship would be iconic. Um, but who do you think dominates this weekend? And do you think that we see a certain energy drink team getting overtaken in the constructors championship this weekend? Oh, by Ferrari! I was gonna say, haven't McLaren already overtook took them? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was like. Okay, I um, was so like bad reporting, Tiana. <laughs> <laughs> to make it for you. Um, no, thank you. No, 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 no. you don't see them. You don't see them overtaking them. Yeah. Currently, they are on. Currently, Red Bull is on five hundred and four points. Um, Ferrari are on four hundred and ninety six, meaning they have to literally outscore them by eight, like nine. They have to score them, outscore them by nine points, and to win. 
to like get to P2. And then McLaren are in front by 40 points on 544 points. So it is very close, especially with the top three. Um, I see a lot of it. I don't see, I don't know if I see a lot of it changing. I see maybe second and third coming, like changing more than I see like first changing. If you get what I mean. I think McLaren will run away with it. I don't think I don't think they will necessarily run away with it. I think constructors will definitely go down to Abu Dhabi, but um, I think McLaren will win it. But I just don't. I also think it'll it'll be crazy. Like, can you imagine this? Twenty twenty five, last last year of the regs, last year of these regs. Katie is imagining it, so you all need to close your eyes and imagine it. Twenty twenty five, we're in Australia, not Bahrain. We're in Australia. Um, and you know what? We F one drivers walk into the paddock. Um, Lewis Hamilton, he's walking into he's working into Ferrari for the very first time, and Ferrari is the second, the second like hospitality unit. They are the second garage. like team there. They're the second garage. Can you imagine? Lennon Norris, Oscar Piastri, Oscar Piastri walking into his first home Grand Prix yeah. as the first team. As the first, he's, team he's got a long walk. He's got a so long walk. Long walk to the long walk to the end of the pit lane. Like, can you imagine? Like, can you imagine? And can you imagine then for to be fair? Massive- so we mentioned earlier that Helmut Marko is getting older. Perhaps this is a technique by him. He just doesn't want to walk as long anymore. He just doesn't got it in him. He's like, this is my last. Whenever Red Bull starts like losing plays in the constructive, sorry, I actually, I just, just can't do it. Can't, can't walk all the way to the end anymore. Um, no, I just think it's really. But can you imagine for like Max Verstappen and like the entire Red Bull team? They've become so accustomed to like walking all the way down and walking into that first one and just being like, yeah, that's that's our place. But it's but it's very much likely not going to be their place next year. And that's something crazy to think about. But um, I genuinely think it'll be McLaren 1, Ferrari 2, Red Bull 3. Um, but, yeah, I think that's it. Katie, your thoughts on the championship standings for the constructors? Uh, for constructors, McLaren, Red Bull, Ferrari. McLaren, Red Bull, Ferrari, yeah. That that's I, I see that as well. Um, but yeah. Okay, now for the Im- most important part of this weekend, Katie, what are your actually no, I didn't talk about this. FP one session. Invaded by rookies. It is the it is FP one and we are surrounded okay. by rookies. We have Pato or Ward who will be filling in for Lando Norris. We have Oli Berman in Ferrari. I'm not sure who he's replacing he's yet. We have Kimi Antonelli who will be in Hamilton in Mercedes, Robert Schwartzman at Salba, and then Felipe Drogovic in Aston Martin. We have a few drivers this weekend completing FP1 sessions, obviously. Who are you most excited for? The one I'm most excited for, Pato Award at McLaren at home, obviously, Mexican driver. I just think the scenes, the sights, the sounds are going to be intense. We love a good home Grand Prix, so we love a good home FP at rookie FP1 session, even. Katie, who are you most excited to see this weekend? One that is going to be in the British Racing Green car, Filippo Drogovic, one of my favourite drivers. Drogovich. I love him yes. so much. Yes. Recently, he just did a really cool photo shoot with um, Gabriel Waterletto. Yeah, my shoot. king. That was genuinely like our peak. Like we peaked in that moment. My, my fave, your fave. They just did it for us, really. Um, yeah. Now, Katie, your podium predictions for the Mexican Grand Prix in 2024? Uh, Sergio Perez wins. Yep. Um, Sergio yep. Perez, Lando Norris. Um, Oscar Piastri. Max was happy DNFs. <laughs> Something wild happens. I actually think Sergio Perez hits Max Verstappen. Someone hits Max Verstappen into turn one. That's my bold prediction for this weekend. Someone, we're going into turn one, and you know how, like, last year, Sergio Perez got taken out during lap one? That exact thing happens, but with Max Verstappen. I'm just calling it now. Anyways, um, my podium predictions are Oscar Piastri P1 because someone made a really fair point on TikTok. Can you imagine Can you imagine the awkward scenes when Oscar Piastri has to come up with his car on that lift? Can you imagine how awkward he's going to be and how he's just going to be sitting there? I need to see it. Like, like F1 script writers, we need to get Oscar Piastri to win this Grand Prix because I just need to see that. Um, And then I say, I want, I want, Sergio Perez to do well because I love seeing people do well at their home Grand Prix. So I'm gonna say Oscar P1, um, Sergio Perez P2, and then Lennon Norris P3. So that's my podium predictions. But Katie, it's now time for your favorite segment. Uh, for your segment, your first segment. Have you been paying attention? 
Oh, yeah, I am paying attention, which is why I know that it's now my time for this one. So let's see if Tiana has been paying attention. It was Charles's third win of the season, but which one of his career was his fifth of his career, his sixth of his career, his seventh or his eighth? Oh, man, I have no idea. Um, oh, like, I want to say – okay, let me, let me think in my head. So there was three this year. Last year, he won none. The year before – he won like three. I'm gonna say seventh, eighth. What have eight. you decided? Eight. Eight. Yeah. Good, correct, well done. Yeah, okay, so obviously Lewis Hamilton. We didn't talk about this. Lewis Hamilton DNF the race in the weekend. If you guys didn't know, oh, yeah. um, how many races has Lewis Hamilton not finished in the US though? One, two, three, or four. Well, I feel like. Oh, well, I was going to say zero, but he DNF'd last week. So I'd say one. Say one? Good work. Pierre Gasly actually got his best qualifying of the season. Which position did he qualify in? Was it A, P7, B, P8, C, P9, or D, P10? Um, he didn't. P, no, P7, I think. P7. Good work. Well done. You're doing really well today. How many uh, Liam Lawson pretty much started from back on the shores of New Zealand? He had pretty significant <laughs> grid penalties this weekend. How many places what was his grid 60. penalty? Was it 40? It was 60. Good work. How many points behind Verstappen is Norris at the moment? 59. 56 That's- or 59? It's, it's in the 50s. But the options it's... are 57, 58, 59, or 60. Oh, 59. Because it's, it's on my box box. Like, I got, like, I'll show you. Uh, I'll show you. It's so cute. About uh, okay, it's 57. You got it wrong. Oh. Yeah, it is 57, actually. It does say it right here. 57. It's, like, powered by Quadrant as well, and it's, like, 57. Anyways, continue. Um, okay. Instead of doing Drive of Your Life this week, oh, okay. We're going to do something called Mount Rushmore. We're going to do Mount Rushmore. Okay, I've thought of one an iconic tweet. I've thought of one. Okay. I fear everyone cool. thinking about the same one, but. Yeah, go ahead. Give Give me your first one. It is, I am not be, I will not be racing for Alpine in 2025, 2023. You have to read out the actual tweet. Hold on. Okay. Okay, so my first one is, of course, fun fact. Jensen was the first driver to press the DRS button, and someone has like replied to it and said that's a lot of middle names. Okay, yep, yeah, that's 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 a that's that's a great one. That's a great one. Now, my my favorite one is I understand that without agreement, Alpine F one have put out a press release late this afternoon saying I will be driving for the I am driving for them. This is wrong. I have not signed a contract with Alpine for twenty twenty three. I will not be driving for Alpine next year. Obviously, Oscar Piastri's iconic quote. Oh, I've got another um, oh, far out. I've got another Oscar Piastri one. Oh man, Oscar Piastri is just such a. Is this like his DRS tweets? His DRS tweets were so iconic. Oh no. Oh my gosh! Wait. Okay, I've got one. I've I've got a great one. Have you have you found your team? Yeah, go, just go your way. Okay, so someone tweeted, what if Lewis Hamilton just tweeted who the F is Nelson PK, then closed Twitter, and Lewis Hamilton replied, imagine. What? Sorry, go ahead. So someone tweeted, like this was when Nelson PK like came out and said all that racist stuff about Lewis Hamilton, yeah. right? And so someone tweeted, what if Lewis Hamilton came on, just tweeted who the F is Nelson PK, and then just closed Twitter, and like Lewis Hamilton has responded saying, imagine. Okay, so that's number three. The number four that I'm trying to put up is someone said, <clears throat> Formula One is a sport for scumbags. McLaren is one of employing Oscar <laughs> Piastri and Murder who shot his girlfriend. It makes me cry every single time. It's so funny. Okay, so, of course, we had... <laughs> Jensen Button, that's a lot of that's a lot of middle names. We had Oscar Piastri, or is it Oscar Pistori? Yes, yes. Pistori? Pistori. Pistori. Um we had I'm making this into a like a teaser for the 
for for what today's yeah. episode of Fifty Fifty. We had Fifty. Lewis Hamilton. Uh, and imagine. Also PK. Yes, and then we also had. Um, Piastri is iconic. Yeah, without my agreement. Oh my god, that is such that's such an iconic. And that's all for today, folks. Thanks for coming along, brother, from the field. Today. <laughs> Literally, um, we, we love you all. Enjoy we love you loads. Your Yes, thank you for so much for joining us in this episode of From the Field to the Track. We love you. So make sure you like and subscribe to keep up to date with all things From the Field to the Track. And we'll see you in the next one. Bye! Yeah.